We have Tandika Mukandawiri, who is going to talk about social policy as an integral part of a developmentalist state, which is what you need to bring about structural transformation. He is the first one to hold the chair in African development at the London School of Economics and Politics. And he is also holds the Olaf Palmer Professor for Peace with the Institute for Future Studies in Stockholm. He is the former director of the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development, as well as the former director of the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa. He has published prolifically on development, often with a focus on Africa. He has many publications. One among his forthcoming ones is a publication on welfare regimes and economic development. I'll be speaking about social policy and development, and, and the title of the paper is uh, quite ambitious, transformative social policy and, and development to state. But basically, what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do is uh, to relate, if you like, uh, social policy to the process of, 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 of radical change, of, of structural change, if you like. And, and a little background to this, that um, I, for 11 years I was heading an institution in the UN, a UN institution in, in Geneva, and we had a, a project which was called Social Policy in a, in a Development Context. And the question we were trying to answer is, what is the role of social policy for a, a country that is trying to catch up? And we published about 11 books and 100 papers and we, we had more than 100 scholars worldwide involved in this project. And there were a couple of lessons. Uh, one of the most important lessons that came out from this was, uh, at least for me, was uh, to, uh, to real, the realization that social policy must at least perform four functions. Uh, it must be involved, obviously, with the reproduction of society. Uh, it must be involved with protection of citizens. It must be involved with distribution and involved with production. And usually the last part uh, is ignored. And, uh, and I, I may I'll stress on that, not because I think the others are, are less important, but just because of the nature of the, of the, of the, of the conference, I was I'll, uh, stress on, on production. We also learned from this project we had that pro-poor policies are usually very poor policies. Uh, and they're poor because uh, they are usually they're poor in political terms. They don't get much support. They are poor because they don't get uh, good funding. They are poor because um, the, 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 money, the monies allocated to them are very, very small. And if you take in the US, uh, the difference between, say, the political wealth of the social security schemes and food stamps, you give an idea what I mean, that is, if a program is, is pro-poor, it will most likely have very little support from the middle class. So we thought that if, if, we, if social policy is going to be useful in developing countries, it must be at the core of the model. It must not be periphery to the model. And we then looked, we, in, the, in the studies we conducted, we looked at sort of late industrializers from Nordic countries, from uh, the uh, Latin American, Af African, the developmental states of Asia. And, uh, and what we saw there was uh, that what surprised, at least what surprised us, was that very few people who write about developmental states actually look at the social policy part of the story. Uh, and yet, if you actually look at the states of this country's history, you find out that social policy was very important. You also find out that the, among the late industrializers, that is, the pioneers of sort of the modern welfare state were not the leading countries like UK. It was the, the late industrializers, like Germany and all that. That's the Bismarck welfare state being a good example. That in fact, that if you're catching up, social policy becomes one of the major instruments for catching up. And so that would be really the main part of my, my, my the main thesis of my discussion. However, the as I said, the literature on development state, developmental states uh, rarely referred to social policies. And, and I suspect that one of the reasons that, one of the problems that happened was that, okay, let me just get, get back a little bit. At the time our project was going on, there were two sort of major literatures that were relevant for understanding poverty. One was the literature on the developmental state, which was for developing countries, and there was a large 
a literature on welfare regimes, which, which called varieties of capitalism or whatever you call it, but in, a, in, a, in a, a literature comparing welfare regimes in the developed countries. These two literatures never talk to each other. Although they were about poverty, equity, there was very little, uh, uh, very little uh, uh, connection between the two literatures. And I suspect that has to do at least with, with at least three reasons. One reason being that, in one sense, the, the welfare state in the north, in the rich countries, was framed in a more Keynesian framework, while as the developmental state literature was much more Schumpeterian. And, and because the welfare state in Europe was discussed in terms of demand management, many people felt that it was not relevant for, for poor countries which were concerned with supply side problems. And so that created a gap in a way uh, between what, my, what people thought was a, a Keynesian concern with demand management and the developmental concern with supply um, development. However, we looking at, again, late industrializing countries, uh, let's say not Nordic countries, you find that they had a view of the welfare state which was much more Schumpeterian. And, and the Schumpeterian part of it was this, that you know, when Schumpeter talks about capitalism being, that one of the driving forces of capitalism is creative destruction. And so the, they thought of, they accept that idea, people like Gunnar Mildal and all, they, they accept that capitalism is, has this dynamism which is destructive and, uh, and creative. And you find policies that allow for that process to take place while protecting citizens. Okay. So wealth, the welfare state becomes then a way of managing the destructive capacity of capitalism. That is, to allow it to be creative, you must protect the, the, uh, the citizens. In other words, um, crudely stated, you protect not the, not, the, not the job, but the worker. So if a job is destroyed, it's not important as long as the worker is protected. So you had, in a way, so there, there has been, in a way, in, within, even within the developed countries, uh, a supply side concern of the welfare regimes. Otherwise, they wouldn't. Uh, I mean, welfare regimes are, after all, based on full employment and so forth. So they do actually worry about. Uh, Production, but it didn't. In, in the literature, when you read the literature carefully, there's very little mention about this dynamic aspect of the welfare state. So I personally felt that there ought to be a marriage between these two literatures, which has been my, my big obsession for the last <laughs> last 11. I haven't sorted out the problem yet. Uh, the other problem, I think, was uh, which has, again there was a, a certain fear of instrumentalizing social policy. People think of social policy as dealing with things of intrinsic value, you know, equity and you know, and inclusion, and so if you talk about using it as an instrument, people, some people are turned off. You know, they think that you cannot use things of intrinsic value for, uh, for such instrumental purposes. I think it's, a, it's an unnecessary debate. I think if you, if you can somehow, if, if normatively your ends and means are the, you know, uh, 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 you know, correspond, there is no problem. The problem arises when you use your, when your ends are used to justify your means, then you have a problem. Yeah? So I have no problem with self. If, if equity is enhanced by equity, it doesn't bother me. Um, and so there was, in a sense, you might call it a, a developmentalist uh, fear, sort of, you know, a, a normative fear of, uh, uh, especially here, very much from people who were, about, were considered social rights, that they don't like to hear the idea that you're talking about social rights as instrumental for, the, for something else. Um, but as I said, I think the experience, the experience we got from, from our literature, that we, from the studies we did, was that societies do actually manage to reconcile the two, to have your, your means as, as, as also, um, uh, as at least normatively compatible with your ends. Now, of course, um, having, now if I turn now to the sort of more instrumental part of social policy, and I, I, I do that, fully aware of the non-instrumental value of social policy. And in fact, I would argue that the main challenge for social policy, for thinking about social policy, is how to use social policy as a transformative instrument without compromising its things of its, without, without compromising its intrinsic value. Um, but having said that, all social policy obviously has, is driven by, by ideologies, by norms, or what Ju George Bush called the vision thing. Um, whatever that meant to him. But anyway, uh, um, 
the point, the, the point is that you have, you have to have some vision of society, and, and that's, that's a, I think, it's a very important part of a social pol policy. And when you look at uh, development models, implicit in all of them is some vision of how society looks like. And that, is, uh, and that usually distinguishes one society from another. And society, social policy has been driven by all kinds of, all kinds of ideologies, from nationalism to uh, uh, you know, nation building to uh, solidarity or class solidarity and so forth. And those are an important part of the ideologies. Now, on the more instrumental aspect of social policy, I identify at least four roles of social policy. One is the legitimacy part of social policy, which is the political role of social policy in sustaining an accumulation model. Uh, the point I'm, I, I believe strongly, and I think it was, it was James O'Connor in this, in this, who said that in, this, in the 70s, that in a capitalist economy, you have to worry about accumulation and legitimacy, you know, and that there's often tension between those two, and that social policy is a, an instrument for helping you handle that. The second, of course, the accumulation and investment, and the th then the third be human resource development, and then fourth the labor market. And I'll go uh, as quickly as I can through that. The legitimacy problem is of social policies uh, should be obvious, at least from Karl Polanyi's work, uh, that you, needed, you need social policy to embed the market, to make, in, basically to make capitalism possible in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, to be, to be the project of capitalism uh, accepted by, uh, socially acceptable. And so you need uh, this embedding of, of, uh, of the accumulation process. And I think this is even more important for late industrializers because social uh, structural change is very, very disruptive. Uh, you know, uh, millions of people moved around from their villages to the cities. You have to house them. And, and, and it is not surprising that, again, among the late industrializers, the so-called social question arises precisely with industrialization. And so you need assist, some legitimation of that process, and social policy plays that important role of embedding that particular model that you have uh, in, um, uh, for accumulation. In other words, it ensures peace, or labor peace. Or, and we've learned all that, uh, of those who run regressions on growth and all that, that one of the most uh, you know, uh, robust <laughs> variables is political stability. That if you cannot ma ma uh, manage the stability of your uh, process of accumulation, you will most likely uh, uh, collapse. And we have seen collapses in, uh, you know, uh, which, uh, which countries that are performing well, like Tunisia <laughs> recently, one of the more recent cases, which was held as a success story, collapses because of some fundamental problems with the, uh, with the model in terms of uh, uh, the absence of peace. The, now, on on the productive side of social policy, the, obvious, the first obvious one, of course, is uh, reproduction. Um, we take that very lightly in, in some of the literature on development, but the, the role of gender, of family, and family planning, and, and all that for, for development is huge. Uh, if you take just the, the, the China story, you know, the one child story as, a, as, an, as an aspect of social policy, has had a huge implication on China's uh, prospects. In other words, your, the, the demographics of your, 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 your country and, and the, the transitions that you make, in, so the demographic transitions, are influenced quite, you know, quite significantly by what policies you pursue with respect to family, to family planning, to uh, uh, female labor's participation in the you know, in labor, uh, labor market participation, how, the, how, how the, uh, the, the burden of the household is shared and so forth. Then we have the social, the, the more basic one, which is social protection and, 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 and again, and development. Uh, social protection has huge implications for accumulation. Uh, first, in a very simple way, through pension funds. Some of the largest chunks of money in poor countries are monies that are from pension funds. And how you use those monies can have a very significant impl uh, impact on your, on your development. In some of the late industrializers, like, say, like Finland, for instance, it was pension funds that funded the electrification of the country, that funded the railroads of the country. And, and I'm told in the US, uh, pension funds have been a very significant part of the IT, the, 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 uh, the, the, the information technology uh, uh, development because of their, of their much longer, longer, longer term perspective. 
But you do, the point is that this, these monies are huge monies, and how they are managed affects your economy. In the 80s, there was, well, under structural adjustment, there was a realization of how important these monies were, and I think the World Bank quite systematically went about privatizing pension funds. And, well, they, for, for, for two reasons. One was just purely ideological. They, wanted, they didn't want to have funds that appeared to be uh, under the control of the state. But there was also a, a belief that you could uh, use them for uh, kick-starting stock markets around the world. And, uh, and this shift of this use of these monies um, in, in a way for, for, if you go, in Africa, most of these monies are now being used, at least in Southern Africa. Most, almost all the shopping malls in Southern Africa are using pension funds. Uh, and that, so they have used, they, you know, they have lost that potential of being an, a significant part of uh, uh, investment in, for long-term um, funding. And these pension funds can also affect how financial markets work. Uh, the, the reason why financial markets in Europe, especially on the continent, differ substantially from the sort of Anglo-Saxon model, one of the reasons is, is the role of pension funds. Uh, who, which in a way act as kind of a slowing mechanism. See what I mean? Yours says just five minutes, mine says six minutes. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so I'll rely on yours. I'm getting there. Um, so you have monies that are collected for protection, for social protection, that have developmental implications. And, and I, the point I'm trying to make that one should be aware of that, that these monies may have been uh, collected for, for protection, but they can be used for developmental purposes. As for distribution, that's perhaps a uh, well-known story, that distribution is good for growth. Um, but I think that in the last 10, uh, well, the, the, the discussion on distribution that I, has uh, been going on the last 20 years is, is not for me satisfactory for, for one reason, for, for, for the following reason. I think that if you think of much of, you know, the, in, in, when I read economics, the, the main focus was, was, was on functional income distribution, wages, profits, rent, rents, and, uh, and interest rates. And in more, today, the focus is much on personal income distribution, on the Gini coefficients, on the share of different households. I think they have, they have a, the two, the, these, uh, two approaches do have different meanings for developmental thinking. I think if your focus is on poverty, short-term poverty, Personal income distribution is the right one to focus on. If your focus is on long-term economic growth, you have to worry about functional income distribution because you have to worry about who gets the profits and what do they do with the profit. The most difficult thing for, um, in the capitalist economies, for poor countries, for everywhere, generally, is how do you ensure that labor is patient and capital is patient. By that I mean, how do you ensure that labor accepts that it will earn less than its productivity, and that the capitalists accept that they will reinvest their profit? In other words, how do you make labor patient and the capitalist patient? And, and they are, oh, one of the functions social policy has had, actually, is performing that function or persuading labor that if they forego their consumption now, they will get the reward and their guarantees by the welfare state that their you know, postponed consumption will result in, into uh, investment which will result in higher employment for the future. For most poor countries, the headache still exists, the guarantee that if you forego your consumption now, what guarantee is there that the money will be reinvested? Uh, and, that, and that interest, I think, ironically, uh, which I th was uh, presumably f focused, which was, I suppose, a leftist uh, concern, has come up in, the more, in more recent de debates about the crisis in the, in the developed countries, including from within the IMF. The IMF, the IMF had a study last year, which was it, no, two years ago, actually, which showed that, which suggested that one of the reasons for the crisis in Europe and uh, in the Western countries was the shift of incomes from wages to, not to profit, but to, to rents and... Uh, and finance, and, and that, that has, was part of the, uh, the crisis that you have, uh, you have today. But anyway, the point that I think that if you are really concerned about long-term development, you have to worry about functional income distribution. Um, oh, God, it's my quick. 
And of course, the other thing which, was, uh, which matters a lot for social policy is the labor market policies. Um, I think to understand one of the most important elements of capability formation that, uh, uh, that we talked about is what happens in labor markets. Again, our research on late industrializers suggested that it was the, what people, somebody has called the training regimes of different societies, how societies you know, skill their labor, that is so decisive to, to uh, uh, how, how well they grow. And the problem with, with, uh, with, uh, with, um, with labor, labor markets is that you have to have incentives for workers to invest in themselves, and you have to have incentives for employers to invest in the workers. There are serious problems of, of uh, externalities in the sense that there's no guarantee for a worker that if he, if he or she invests time in, in, uh, in, in, in acquiring knowledge, she will be employed. And there's no guarantee for the employer that if she, tra if she trains you, if, the, if the, employer, uh, the employer trains the workers, they will stay on. And again, social policy has played a very important role in managing uh, that problem of, of, of collective action and in trying to reconcile of, sorry, of co of coordination of, between the, the demand for skills and the supply for skills and the, the effort made by the, the different actors in the market. And if you read so the German social markets or the Nordic uh, uh, welfare state ma 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 or the Japanese lifetime employment, these are policies that are partly trying to resolve that problem. And in, in many countries, in, in, in the developing countries, we do not have make social policies that allow, that facilitate that acquisition of, of, of skills. Um, finally, there is how, again, how technology becomes accepted. Uh, we assume that uh, we can have a debate about choice of techniques, whether they should be capital intensive or labor intensive and so forth. But at the heart of all that is also the acceptance of technologies. Uh, and many of the uh, debates when I was when I read economics was a whole big debate of choice of techniques, what it was called whether we, one should choose techniques that are surplus maximizing or employment maximizing. Generally, social policy allows you to do both at the same time. Uh, it allows you to have technologies that are employment generating, and allow to have technologies that are high uh, that are um, productivity enhancing. And you do that by all kinds of measures that include wage compression, and, you, and again, if you, um, if you again look at the, I would even argue that the crisis, the crisis in, of Greece today is a reflection of social policies in Germany, but how you manage your labor and the, and the labor cost and the imp implication of that on, on Germans, uh, the, the Germans' capacity to, exp to export. I would argue, therefore, as a conclusion, that I think we ought to, um, when we think of structural changes, we have to think about social policy because one, the human factor of, two, the protection of people through this uh, crisis of, uh, of, of change, three, the legitimation of the process of change, which is very, very, very uh, uh, radical, and finally, that it creates, the, it embeds the process of accumulation in a model that is socially acceptable. Thank you.